Hi. Um, today we're going to cover 4.3 reciprocal trigonometric ratios. And uh, a lot is made about the mathematical interpretation of them. You were just supposed to know that, for example, um, well, let's just review SOHCAHTOA first of all. The sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. Now, um, you probably also know that there are inverse trigonometric ratios. That for example, if I know if I know the opposite over hypotenuse already, I can find the angle theta through the inverse sine. So the inver these are called inverse trigonometric ratios, or inverse, not inverse trig ratios, but inverse trig functions. Um, it's it's a word that I don't like. I don't like calling them functions we end up with a problem where we have multiple values of y for the same value of x. So, um, and I'm, I'm just thinking ahead to the graph. Really, sine and cosine and tan, none of these are one-to-one, -one, not a single one of them. If I knew what the trig ratio was for sine, but I didn't know the angle, I could feed that into the inverse of sine and figure out what the angle actually is. Okay, so that's why we call them an inverse function. It's inverse in the sense that it reverses the operation of what sine should be doing. Remember, the input value of sine is the angle theta, and the output is the trig ratio opposite over hypotenuse. Okay? Whereas here, for the inverse function, the input is opposite over hypotenuse, and the output is the angle. It's completely backwards. But that's what you would expect from an inverse function. People seem to confuse inverse with reciprocal because not only are there not only are there inverse trig functions, you cannot confuse them with the reciprocal trig functions. And that minus one that is on all of these inverse trig functions signifies that it is an inverse. Not, this is not an exponent. And what are reciprocal trig functions? For the inverse of sine, 1 over sine theta, which is totally not what this is, but 1 over sine theta actually results in a, a new function called cosecant theta, which we abbreviate CSC. We spell it out as cosecant. Okay? So C-O-S-E-C-A-N-T is, is how it is spelled. And then 1 over cosine. Again, that's not what this is, okay? D please do not take that as an exponent. Anyway, so 1 over cos theta is... By the way, if you really do want to know, if you really do want to use minus 1 as, a, as an exponent, I would suggest you do this, cos theta in brackets to the minus 1 like that, okay? At any rate, what you get from 1 over cosine is the inverse cosine, also known as secant theta. Um, this is expressed as SEC theta, but is just spelled out as secant, S-E-C-A-N-T. Now, there is one more. There's the one, uh, 1 over tan theta. Again, that's not what this is. That's not the same as this inverse tan. 1 over tan theta still takes an argument theta. It's still... Uh, oh, hold on a minute. This becomes cotan theta. Oh. Okay, C-O-T is the abbreviation. I'll spell it out in a minute. And we spell it out like I was about to. Cotangent. Okay? This is the cotangent of theta. Now, notice they are reciprocal in the sense that they still, because it's 1 over the function, the input value is still the angle. Over here, the input value for the inverse function is not the angle, it's the ratio. 
So guess what? We also can speak of CSC, CSC, to the minus one, meaning the inverse cosecant of, well, okay, so if it's one over sine, then it's not opposite over hypotenuse, it's hypotenuse over opposite, right? It's the reciprocal of the trig ratio. So this is the cosec the inverse cosecant of hypotenuse over opposite, which is equal to theta, okay? Once again, the input value is backwards. The input value is the trig ratio for cosecant. The output value is going to be theta. Okay. So then we could say the same thing about uh, secant. Secant to the minus 1. And secant is 1 over cos. And cos is hypo hy adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, this is going to be hypotenuse over adjacent because that's that's secant that's hypotenuse over adjacent and and this is equal to theta input value is the trig ratio output value is the angle the, what about cotangent cotangent theta well that's going to be well, what's tangent it's opposite over adjacent well, this is going to be adjacent over opposite. Right? It's going to be flipped over. So cotangent, cotangent of uh, to the minus 1 of adjacent over opposite, the inverse cotangent is going to be theta, just like all of them. Okay? So these all point to theta. These all point to theta because these are... These are more inverse trig functions. These are even more inverse trig functions. You know, you have to remember a clear distinction between what is a reciprocal trig function. That's where you flip over a fraction or you do one divided by the function, right? Or an inverse trig function where the domain and range switch, right? The domain, if the domain and range have to switch, then you're talking about a uh, inverse trig function. If you're talking about flipping something over as a fraction, you're talking about a reciprocal trig function. I'm going to draw a unit circle again, that magical circle I, in the last video. This is really a radius of 1, I, because this is supposed to be a unit circle. So, so as before... We have those four points that cross at 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1. That's not so important right now, but, you know, it sort of gets you started. You remember that all points on the unit circle have the coordinates cos theta sine theta, right? The x value of the coordinate on any point in this circle is cos theta and the y value is always sine theta. That's the nice thing about the unit circle, and if that unit circle were moved, say, somewhere else on the Cartesian plane, that would be ruined, the magic is gone, and we're back to the real world, and it's just, then it's just a circle, you know. Or if we change the radius, eh, yeah, then it's just a circle. But still, you know, even if you change the radius, if you change the radius from 1 to 2, then what you end up doing is you're multiplying the trig ratio by the, whatever the radius is. So if it's 2, then you're multiplying the trig ratio by 2. So there's, eh, well, let's just say it's semi-magic. But right now, I want to talk about um, a graphical interpretation of the trig ratios, which is not often spoken about. But what does it look like on the unit circle? You recall that I said this perpendicular that I'm dropping down. Well, that perpendicular, if we take the length of that, it's the distance from the positive x-axis up to the circle, and we call that the sine of theta, right? Without any trig ratio, because any trig ratio we attempt, we're just dividing by 1 anyway, because 1 is the 
radius of the unit circle. And then we said that the, that the distance from here to the y-axis, from where the point of contact of this line that we just dropped from the point on the circle touched by the, um, touched by the uh, terminal arm of the angle down to the x-axis, that point of contact on the x-axis, that distance to the origin, is called cos theta, right? It's the x-coordinate, really. It's the x-coordinate of, of the point of contact between the terminal arm of the angle and the unit circle, okay? Well, we could make a little bit of a, uh, a rectangle here. I can draw a dotted line. That dotted line is still cosine. That length is still cos theta. And this length is still sine theta, right? Going this way, and that's only going up to here, by the way. I don't mean, I don't mean to suggest the entire y-axis. But sine theta is here, cos theta is there. <coughs> Ever wondered where tangent fit into this? Well, we know it's sine divided by cosine, right? That you could always, you know, if you know these two ratios, you could always find tan, right? Like if you know sine and you know cosine, you pretty much know all six trig functions. Like the uh, cosecant is one over sine, the cosine is one over cosine, uh, sorry, the secant is one over cosine, and then the tangent is sine over cosine, right? It's, it's, the, it's the y over the x. Well, x over y becomes the, the cotangent, cosine divided by sine. But it's rather curious where all these um, all these trig functions fit on the graph. And it turns out the tangent, if you ever learned what a tangent to a curve is, well that exact that is exactly true on the unit circle. It's the tangent to the unit circle. And this tangent is divided into two pieces. So the tangent is this line which touches the unit circle at exactly one point of contact and then keeps going. Well, ever wondered what the distance from the point of contact is to the x-axis? Well, that happens to be tan theta, right? That distance from the point of contact to the unit circle to the x-axis is tan theta. What about the other one? What about this one? It turns out that the, point of, the distance from the point of contact between the tangent line and the unit circle and the y-axis is cotan theta. And, well, is it easy to see that these are reciprocals of each other? That tan is 1 divided by cotan, that cotan is 1 divided by tan? A little hard to appreciate, right? But let's say, let's say that this terminal arm was moved to 0 degrees, okay? Now, if it was moved to 0 degrees, the tangent line would be completely vertical, right? Now, the tangent line, I said, was defined as the distance between the point of contact along the tangent line to the x-axis. This distance is tan theta. Well, what is the distance now between the x-axis and the point of contact of the unit circle? Well, it happens to be zero, right? It's zero. It's right on the x-axis, okay? So for an angle of zero, the tan of zero happens to be zero. But what happens to that tangent line? As you can see, it's vertical. So, is there a point of contact between, if we're thinking of this as the part of the line that deals with the cotangent, well, what's its point of contact with the y-axis if this line happens to be parallel? Well, by definition, parallel lines never meet. And so the distance here is infinity, or what we really say is undefined. So if if tan of theta is zero, I'll write in a darker ink here. If tan of theta is zero, then cotan theta is one over tan theta. It's one over zero, which is undefined. Okay. Well, okay. Fine. 
What about the other one? What about if tan is, what about if the angle is 90 degrees? So what if the terminal arm of the angle moves up here and then we have an angle of 90 degrees in standard position? Then the tangent line looks like that. And now, what's the distance between the point of contact of that tangent line and the y-axis? Because that'll give us co cotan theta. Well, it turns out it's zero because it happens to be right on the y-axis, just like this was for the x-axis. So cotan theta is zero. So tan theta is undefined because it'll it's parallel to the x-axis and it'll never touch, right? So that's that's the the graphical sort of the if you if you like to think in pictures that's the graphical representation. Meanwhile, what about if we took the distance from that point of contact to the y-axis along the x-axis? What's that distance known as? It's actually the inverse of cosine. It's one over cosine. So that happens to be secant theta. So this distance is where secant theta comes from. And notice that if, so basically if we're talking about the point of contact between um, the tangent line and the x-axis to the, to the y-axis, that distance, well, what's the shortest distance secant can have? The shortest distance is really, this can only get as short as the radius. This tangent line will never go inside the unit circle. So this distance for secant theta will never get any shorter than one. Conversely, cosine will never get any greater than one. <coughs> cosine will never go beyond the unit circle, right? So its maximum value that cosine can return is one. Here the minimum value that secant can return is one. Well, okay, what about the cosecant of theta? What about if we... Cosecant of theta is this distance. It's kind of like secant theta, except we're going from the point of contact of the cotangent with the y-axis uh, to the x-axis. So this becomes secant theta, uh, sorry, cosecant theta. So... And the same argument applies. The minimum value cosecant theta can possibly have for the same reasons I just stated is one. So cosecant theta will always only have a, a minimum value of one, just like secant will. And it's for the same reasons, it's because it's dependent on the uh, point of contact of the tangent line with either the y or the x-axis, in this case, the y-axis. So it can only go as low as one just like sine can only go as high as one, right? Sine can only have a maximum of one. Cosecant can only have a minimum of one. Well, it gets a little stranger than that because I haven't really spoken about, um, like, for example, what if, what if I drew a, an angle here? So here we have a new angle. Um, so I'll call that alpha in red. Okay, so I got this new red angle. Now, um, let's say now the, here is its sine, right? Cosine is this, right? The sine is positive, the cosine is negative because we're in quadrant two, because the cast rule, right? Uh, the cast rule, if we divide the Cartesian coordinate plane into four quadrants, in quadrant one, everything is positive, like all the trig ratios are positive if the angle happens to be in quadrant one. But here, because we're in quadrant two, x is negative, meaning that cosine is now negative, and the only thing that's positive is sine. Well, not just sine, though, because cosecant the inverse sign is also positive, okay? Now, for, um, for the third quadrant, uh, tangent is, po is the only thing positive, and that's because x and y happen to be both negative if the, if the terminal arm happens to fall into quadrant three, 
that means that x and y are both negative. A negative divided by a negative is a positive, so only tangent is positive. But by extension, of course, cotangent is also positive because 1 divided by a positive number is still positive. The cosine is, the cosine is positive in quadrant 4 because x is positive in quadrant 4. Y is negative, so sine will be negative, tan will be negative, cotan will be negative, but cosine and secant theta will both be positive because remember one divided by a positive is still positive. Now let's get back to the topic of this negative, um, this negative, uh, well this angle, it's not a negative angle, this angle that's in the um, quadrant two. Now alpha is here. This would, you know, if you wanted to know this angle here, this is the reference angle, right? If you remember the reference angle, one minus alpha. So back to the six trig ratios. We had sine. We have we have sine which is positive. We have cosine which is negative. And let's draw let's draw our our line, our tangent line, and this time what's happening here well okay remember I said that if I moved this angle up towards here I said the minimum that cosecant can be is one and here the minimum secant can be is one right I, I also want to say that this is slightly stranger than I'm making it it's even stranger still because if I go here Obviously, um, you know, if, if, uh, if I'm measuring this angle, or sorry, this distance, then my, my cosecant is still positive, but here the secant is negative, like this distance here is still secant theta, or secant alpha this time, so I'm using alpha as my symbol. Um, a secant alpha is a negative number. It's going into the negative x-axis. Um, like I said, this distance going from here to here is still positive, so cosecant is still positive, but secant here is negative. But if I go, if this terminal arm moves all the way down to the x-axis, we get an angle of 180 degrees. And if we get that angle, then the secant is equal to the radius of the circle, it becomes 1. Well, so does, uh, or, or sorry, it becomes negative 1, and so does uh, the cosine. Cosine is also negative 1. Secant, at that point of contact, secant and, uh, and secant, secant, sorry, secant and cosine are both uh, negative 1. But secant only gets to negative 1 as a maximum. Either that, or it becomes more negative. Or in this case, if you, again, you want to think of the number line, it gets as high as the radius or lower, meaning more negative in this way. So the secant can be all the way down here, but the but it cannot get above minus 1. But here it cannot get below plus 1. There's an empty region between minus 1 and plus 1, which secant will never be able to equal. We will never get a number between negative 1 and plus 1. So the secant, secant theta can only be greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1, or secant theta can be less than or equal to negative 1, and nothing in between. And notice I actually split that range into two sections, because these are, these are both separate. You cannot, you cannot make this into one statement. Basically, if we had to put this on a number line, we have here is 0, here is 1, here is minus 1. All of these values including 1, and all of these values including minus 1. But nothing in between. Secant doesn't get to any of these values here. But it can only get these values here and these values here. Cosine is the complete opposite. Cosine only gets these values and nothing outside. It comes from the idea that, you know, 1 over x, you know, if, let's say, let's say x is, let's say x is a number, 
um, greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to 1. In other words, let's say x was a lot like our sine or cosine function, okay? And it was only allowed value, it was only allowed to return values between minus 1 and plus 1. If we make a reciprocal of that, then the best we can hope for is 1 over minus 1, which is still minus 1, 1 over 1, which is still 1. But if, if you get inside that value, if you get inside those values, like a half, let's say, let's say x is a half, well, 1 over a half is 2, right? 1 over a third is 3. 1 over a quarter is 4. These are values bigger than 1, right? So the inverse will never reach, the inverse will never have the same range as uh, the, original, uh, the original function, which I'm calling x here. But even if x was just a number, then if, if a number fell between these two numbers, then that implies that basically 1 over x can only be greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to negative 1, right? Um, and which is the exact opposite of what this is. Okay, so that really sets the ground rules for uh, reciprocal trig functions. And also, hope I don't know if this clarified anything. If this totally confused you, you can safely ignore it. I was really attempting to try to give you a geometric interpretation of what's going on with all six trig functions. Because what you're used to seeing is a, is a geometric interpretation of only the three of them. But what about all six acting together? Uh, I also know that there's a GeoGebra app available, which I will post online. But it actually shows you the interactions of all six trig functions. If you move a terminal arm around a circle, a unit circle like this, it shows you how cotan and tan and sine and cosine and secant and cosecant all work together. Uh, it's kind of, kind of fun, but it's really only a big deal if you're a visual learner. I'm, uh, and for my part, I, I do like the visuals. I do like... But really, uh, in the, at the end of the day, what we want to get at are these trig ratios and also the, um, the reciprocal trig functions and how they relate to each other algebraically. That is really the emphasis in this course, although uh, the geometric interpretation is something that I thought I would give to you as a... Um, as a, as a bit of an additional thing, just showing you how how these things all fit together in in a unit circle. Because the unit circle is an amazing tool, and you know, and if you're a visual learner, it's a it's a great thing to see how they are all related, and it's also a great thing to see what the domain and range of these things are.